So welcome everyone. Appreciate your coming. I'm Chuck Lynn. I'm with Simply Living and I'm your host tonight. Uh, happy to uh, play this role being the kind of MC. We've got three great presentations and more an announcement, so it's going to be fun. Appreciate everybody coming. It's uh, been beautiful weather. We'll take it. And uh, we're going to st start with, uh, we have three presentations, and the first one's going to be from Maida Sanchez. Maida is the uh, Executive Director of the Ohio Sustainable Business Council. Uh, she's just an amazing entrepreneur, technical, proficient guru, uh, supporter of, <laughs> of uh, uh, economic development on the local level and uh, all about sustainability. And you can start anytime you're ready, Maida. Okay. Well, I'm Maida. Nice to meet you all. Um, uh, I'm uh, the director of the Ohio Sustainable Business Council. We're a statewide organization founded in 2015. Um, it's a business association of businesses uh, primarily uh, dealing with sustainability. Um, we have a lot of uh, manufacturers, organic manufacturers. Um, they sell pro stores that sell product, organic products, things like that. Um, and uh, also we're... Uh, uh, have members that are businesses that are on, on some point in some path towards sustainability. So they're learning uh, to be more sustainable. Um, and so we we're really proud to be um, partnering with Simply Living on, on several projects. Um, we really have a lot of in common. Um, our goal is to promote um, businesses uh, that value people, profit, and uh, the planet as well, the triple bottom line. And so um, that's what we're about and we, we work all over Ohio. Um, so tonight um, we have a presentation. Uh, the OSBC is um, partnering with Simply Living on one initiative, which is the Public Banking Ohio. Um, and I don't know, Kathy, do you have the PowerPoint presentation? You're muted, uh, Kathy. Let's see if I can share my screen. Um, can everybody see that? Yes. All right, let me start yep. from the beginning. Slide from the beginning. Okay. There you go. Yep. So yes. our first slide, that's just our, our uh, OSBC, uh, OSBcouncil.org is our OSBC uh, website in case you guys want to learn more. Um, next slide. Uh, Public Banking Ohio. And so for our first slide, um, we have, I have a really short video that says a lot more than I can just sit here and talk about. Uh, so Kathy, if you can go to the next slide and play our video, that'd be great. Hey, let's see if I can play this. I may have to make sure it's a, sh okay, let me go share sound. And... And it doesn't seem to want to play. I'm sorry, man. No, no, oh, it's okay. It probably opened in a new tab. Do you have another tab maybe that you can share? Let's see. Not going? It's, um, yeah, I've got too many things open. It's okay. Um, <laughs> maybe I can just play it over here and maybe it'll work. Right. Oh, nope. looks oh like there it goes. Work. There it goes. It's gonna take its sweet time but <laughs> yeah it's it's okay it's really short it's a two minute uh, video it's a good video yeah, yeah it's really illustrative of what pet public bankings is to here Not sure how to get it to go any faster. Circle says that it's really not easy to start a public bank because the big banks don't like it. So it takes a while, right. but we're persistent. Hopefully it will show. <laughs> yeah, ba basically um, the public bank is a publicly owned bank, the residents of a, of a region, a city, um, or a state uh, own uh, the bank and it's instead of a privately owned bank which is working for its shareholders the public bank uh, works for the people of the state um, and so their their mission is a little bit different otherwise they're mostly run like a like a 
much like other banks. And they work with local banks uh, and strengthen the, the local banking network uh, in, in a region that they're operating. Well, let's see. <laughs> in this city, in anywhere you USA, the residents of the city have decided they want to park. The city council agrees the park is a great idea. But how will they pay for it? The city needs to borrow money. But borrowing money means the city has to pay a lot more money in interest and fees that could double the cost of the park. And that money leaves the city. It goes to Wall Street investors who really don't care about the park or the city at all. This is a bad deal for the city and its residents. There's a much better option. An option that's been proven around the world. A public bank. A public bank is a bank owned by the residents of a city, state, region, or territory. Private Wall Street banks just want to make profits for their shareholders. But public banks have a mission to serve the public good. They have to reflect the values and needs of the community. And that makes all the difference. Politicians don't run a public bank. Their job is to just set it up by listening to what the people need and want. Public banks are run by skilled local bankers who know their neighbors. Residents are on the supervising board to keep tabs on what the bank's doing. Public banks can save communities lots of money. First, they cut out expensive Wall Street fees, which can be hundreds of millions of dollars a year in a big city. Second, they can lower interest rates on the city's loans, which means there's more money to spend on other projects. Third, their profits go back to the city, not to Wall Street. So a public bank can make money for the city. All this means the people of the city have a lot more money to fund all the things they need, such as bridges, good roads, good schools, renewable energy, affordable housing, lower taxes, and the park the people wanted. They now control their own money and they can build their own future. Join the movement. To find out more, go to publicbankinginstitute.org. Okay. Okay. Well, you can go to the next slide. Um, we didn't, I didn't see any video there, but that's okay. We got the audio. <laughs> okay. And uh, you, this video is available at the publicbankinginstitute.org. So you get, there are several very good videos on that site. Um, so we can just go over some of the basic um, ideas. Um, we think that uh, the public banking is one solution uh, that localities, uh, cities, and states can use uh, to fund a stronger recovery. Um, it gives another option for funding uh, certain things like infrastructure projects, renewable energy, clean water, affordable housing, um, community development, and nonprofits. And so, some a lot of these things uh, don't really make sense for a private bank to uh, invest in and, and to lend for, and they would usually be a much higher rate um, than would be um, uh, feasible. And so, so basically, that's where the public bank comes in with a mission um, to to fund certain projects uh, that uh, are more long term benefits for a community rather than just a short term where a commercial bank would be interested. So um, yeah, next slide, Kathy. Okay. So this would be a public bank um, is created by um, a city, a state, a municipality. Um, and once they're set up, they are set up like a regular bank. They're run by professional bankers. They're not run by politicians. Um, and they would have transparency. They have a, they usually have a, a really uh, um, specific mission uh, for which they are set up. Uh, some of them are for infrastructure, some for housing, some are for small business recovery and things like that. And, and, and that mission is usually pretty specific. Um, the public bank uh, usually partners with local banks. So we have locally, uh, small local community banks in Ohio. And I know they've been um, hard hit uh, having to compete with big Wall Street banks. And so so the a public bank would partner with local banks and the local banks would be their front office, basically. Um, 
And so the public bank uh, would uh, fund uh, programs uh, and these local banks could um, partner with them. Um, and that way it strengthens our lo small local community banks, um, makes them stronger. Uh, in North Dakota in 1919, uh, the Bank of North Dakota was founded. Um, their mission is to support agriculture, industry, and commerce in the state of North Dakota. And that is the, currently the only publicly owned bank that we have in the United States. Um, and they've been going strong since 1919. Um, they partner with their local banks and um, they only have one office in the whole state. And basically the bankers bank and they all their programs go through local banks. And North Dakota has one of the strongest um, uh, the most number of local community banks uh, that are still flourishing um, because of that relationship um, per capita uh, in North Dakota. Um, they have very strong networks of local banks. So um, it's a good it's a good win win for communities over there. Um, and uh, another byline on, on, on the Bank of North Dakota is they outperform Wall Street banks as far as return on their investment. So they are very, very solid. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so who's in our coalition uh, in Ohio? Um, currently, we have, uh, of course, Simply Living and Ohio Sustainable Business Council. And then we also have Regionomics, our, our friend Bill Lafayette. Uh, it's a very um, active in local economics uh, locally here in central Ohio. We also have uh, the American Independent Business Alliance, which Amoeba has a lot of uh, local businesses that they represent. Uh, and they are actually based in Cincinnati, um, even though they're a national organization. And of course, we have uh, support our local uh, Ohio local economies, otherwise known as Seoul, um, and the banking, the Public Banking Institute, um, which is um, a national organization. Okay, next slide. Um, and to learn more about public banking, you can go to publicbankingohio.org, and that will take you to a page and you can learn, uh, watch the, uh, the actual full video and, and a lot of other uh, information on public banking. I just wanna open it up and uh, see if anyone had any questions. Anybody? We have to watch our time, but if anybody does have a question, let's take the slides down, see, so quick, that's so we can see if anybody has their hands up. How do uh, I raise my hand? Put it in the chat. Okay, so we have. Yeah, a, if you need to raise your hand, there's the little uh, reactions uh, button on your the bottom of your screen usually. Uh, I'm not finding it. Oh, there it I, is. I've got both my hand raised and my hand raised. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Bob, go, ahead. go ahead, Bob. So I was alive during the savings and loan crisis, and I'm sure that most of you were. And is there like the equivalent of an FDIC that insures public banks? Actually, the, the public bank can be required to be insure uh, with FDIC. Oh. So they are like a normal bank in most ways, uh, except that the, they're owned by the state. So yeah, they can they can seek uh, insurance through FDIC. Um, um, we also have. Oh, go ahead, Ma Mary, Mary Jane. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, my name is you know, Mary Jane Gordon, and I, if you know about my relationship with the Free Press, I've been handling the marijuana beat here for about twenty years. Uh, marijuana and banking is a very uh, sensitive issue. There's a number of uh, le uh, hoops that um, uh, banks have to leap through in order to serve cannabis companies. And even if they're legitimate, like in Ohio, we have a legal legal system. Even those cannot get bank accounts necessarily because of the federal uh, regulations. And I could go into this. I actually wrote an article of it about it in January 2019. We'll source it there. Uh, can you tell me how and if they, the uh, uh, public banks can serve the cannabis industry? Well, I, I don't know specifically. Chuck, do you have any any uh, uh, information uh, on that? Yes, it's a, it's a big issue in uh, uh, California, for example. Uh, made a mention that 
And I'm, I'm also on the board of the OSBC. And so there's a connection there. I just all just to divulge that. But uh, so I've been involved with the listening to the uh, uh, a national coordinator call. And even though, yes, uh, many of the banks are set up for a specific purpose, and sometimes they could be done specifically for uh, marijuana, because it's a big, as Mary Jane points out, it's, a, it's a, an issue because the major banks don't want to process or hold for various reasons and it's complicated, but it's still illegal federally, et cetera. So we have to deal with uh, uh, those issues and the, and the public bank uh, could do that. And, uh, and it's being explored there. And I should say there's something like 20, 26 states have something going on where there's a beginning effort to uh, uh, at the state or city and municipal level. So some of the cities have made real progress. You know, Philadelphia is one and New Jersey's governor, Phil Murphy ran on the, uh, uh, the public bank as part of his platform. They're moving it through the legislature there. Uh, Michigan, they're, they're pretty active. So, uh, so yes, a state bank like New Mexico, like uh, North Dakota, can do any kind of. Uh, it's not limited to just housing or just renewable energy or whatever. It's a banker's bank that can loan to uh, the community banks and the uh, credit unions that have a need for uh, for a loan. And uh, for example, just to give you how an idea how broad it can be. Uh, students sometimes move to North Dakota so they can establish residency, renegotiate their student loan down to one and a half percent because they're getting ripped off in other, in other ways. So, so yeah, it's a very uh, flexible uh, system. And uh, I think we're, unless people have more questions, uh, we can move on to the, to the yeah. next presentation. Joe, uh, Joe. We do have one more question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd like to know. I mean, it says the the uh, your presentation says there's only one public bank in North Dakota throughout the country. What's been the deterrent? How come there aren't uh, more of them formed? And my other question is, do these banks function like a, a regular bank? I mean, you know, I put my money in there. They have uh, they have car loans and and uh, personal loans and home equity loans and things like that. Uh, what are they? What does it offer? And you know. Great questions. Thank you. You want, yeah. you want to respond, Maida? Yeah, I can. I can answer some of that. Uh, the reason for the Bank of North Dakota being the only one is is because, as you can imagine, uh, the commercial banks uh, mount quite a, a resistance to uh, the formation of more public banks. Um, it's it's just one of those things where we, you need an impetus. Uh, actually, throughout the country, in in the re last couple of years, there has been a, quite a movement to form public banks again uh, at, at various states. In fact, uh, California passed uh, a law uh, just last October, or maybe it was a year ago, last October, um, to allow for pilots. Uh, they're going to be able to form ten public banks. Uh, in California in the next year or two and they, they're treating them like pilot projects and but they are uh, they finally have passed that and they're going to be able going to go forward. New Jersey has some legislation that's still pending um, they're working on the governor there Phil Murphy is very uh, pro-public bank and so there is quite a movement and a resurgence in this public banking. Uh, of course it's an uphill battle because you're always going to fight Wall Street banks who are going to going to mount a campaign against any of that. Um, to answer about what the public banks can do, um, they can um, actually, uh, they it depends on their charter, on what is in their charter uh, for them to do. Uh, some uh, charters are more specific. They can focus on agriculture loans, farm loans, or, or student loans, or things like that. Um, Generally, uh, I think the model has been very successful in North Dakota, just to use them as the model. Um, they don't uh, have, you know, uh, depository accounts necessarily for, for car loans or things like that. They would work with the local community bank and, um, and lend through the local community bank and making, uh, making those funds available to that bank in order to have programs at particular rates and, and, and work through the banks. They're their front office. Can they be established uh, by a county or a city? So that yes. Does? Okay. Mm -hmm. It could be a city, a county, a group of counties. Thank yeah. you. Mm 
-hmm. we've, we've held a couple of town halls and uh, we've had participation by Mike uh, Stinziano and uh, Liz Brown's office. So they're aware that uh, we're, we're on their case. <laughs> One want, question, so can, my question, we, Chuck. Yeah, go ahead. Is uh, com we've heard the comparison with the private banks. How about the comparison with credit unions? Same, yeah. Up? Credit unions uh, are can also participate. And so it's community banks and credit unions that are locally focused that uh, typically make the uh, arrangements for a loan through the state bank or the city or municipal or county bank. It could be Franklin County. It could be Morpsey, you know, if they have the division to do it. So we're hoping to create uh, a movement of concerned citizens like everybody here, uh, and as well as getting endorsements from other local groups that deal with renewable energy. Uh, we should have added the Ready for 100. Uh, <laughs> Sierra Club is interested in this. And so, yeah, it's, uh, we, we're, it's a movement. It's a process. We're working on it. We want uh, people to sign up. They're going to create a little pledge for publicbankingohio.org so you can sign up and uh, learn more about it. And, uh, and I also recommend the Public Banking Institute, which has an awesome website. A lot of great information, including a series of videos, which we're going to put up on the Simply Living uh, YouTube channel I ever get around to it. Um, we well, yep. have to be careful about time. So yeah, go ahead. Uh. Yeah, there is a mailing list on publicbanking.org. If you go there, it'll go to the public banking site and uh, page on uh, Seoul. And uh, you can, there's a link there to subscribe to learn more and you'll get our, uh, updates on there. Great. So thanks, Maida. And Lynn, you're on deck. I don't know if <laughs> Yeah, well, Kathy is going to control my slides, I believe. Okay, cool. Okay, <laughs> and since tonight is really about Simply Living, I just kind of want to state a, a couple things that these are all the different types of things that Simply Living is involved in. And, and if you're not getting Chuck's weekly updates, um, please do sign up. And that it's all these bigger issues of um, that I hope that you will just kind of reconnect and, and see some of the great stuff going on at Simply, with Simply Living. So support Ohio local economies. You know, Simply Living has been so involved in supporting local businesses for so, so long and even helping to sprout them, things like local matters and some other types of things and all different types of um, businesses. But what this one particularly is, is, is support our local economy. And um, of being a localist, that's been a 10, 10 year, 12 year campaign. Um, and if anybody remembers Small Business Beanstalk, um, that was going on in Columbus, but the whole thing of how do you connect people with the different small businesses that are going on, and and that's really a, a renewed project with Simply Living. So if you want to go, go ahead, Kathy, go to the next um, slide. So we are trying to build a local independent business directory, okay? There is so much great data out there. I don't know if anybody saw the press release, the publicity that happened when a woman during um, COVID was people wanted to buy local, people didn't know where to go. So she created um, a major Google spreadsheet of like over 350 names. And so um, we have borrowed it and been adding to it, but then becomes the real question, how do you then get it out to the public? Okay, so we're trying to build this independent business directory and this is where we need some real IT minds to kind of help us out. So keep on moving over, Kathy. Next one. So we are trying to make it a public searchable, searchable web directory. It can't all be, um, you know, something that being is very small. If we were really a different type of organization, we could take this under our umbrella that every type of organ, every little local business would want to be sustainable and all that good stuff. And certainly that, that is the end direction. We of course want all these different businesses to be part of, but right now it is really supporting local businesses. And then also in my opinion, helping those organizations that all say they're about local businesses to tie into this too. So if you are um, a, with an entity, um, I saw um, the lovely Ryan here on the, on the call about vegan, please help us put these different categories so people can kind of find them. The other purpose is also people can not only come to this place, but if you are an entity that also deals with this kind of data, we want to help you take some of this data back to your sites, okay? So I know it gets kind of questionable, and that's where the, all the IT minds 
have to come in, but it all, all purposeful. Um, in one place, how can we collect it so that we can all utilize it? And um, uh, there's lots of this, honestly, could be a whole evening in of itself, just talking about how we all take our member organizations, bring them together, but also along the way, remind people they are part of our members, but they are in the end businesses in the community trying to do something, make a business every day. So go ahead and go on, Kathy, please. And so we are made it where now businesses can add their listing for free, okay? And we'd really like to be honestly where we could take our database and they could check to see where our data is good. So if you go on Kathy, so you can go to the soul and I believe it'll come up at the end. So currently we have 500 listings, okay? The spreadsheet was great. Um, it didn't have all the great, all the data that public needs, um, but it had a lot of great things. And the other thing that we really want to take to the next level is not only are they local, but how can we also get them to be more sustainable and also being proud of some of the things that they might be doing, like recycling their food waste at their restaurants or just a variety of different things. So again, we, so we have already a database that we've started, but we do need people to kind of help us um, get it to be more presentable and also help direct our public because that's really what it all comes down to. So go ahead and go, Kathy, the next one. And so if you can help us, there's um, the directory you can look at. You can contact myself or any of us with Simply Living um, because it is that bigger, trying to get the bigger picture, but also with all the little details because we want to direct people to our businesses. But we also want our businesses to be able to start looking at these things and being recognized that they are being acknowledged because they are trying hard to make a difference, not just be um, a locally, in addition to being a locally owned business. Um, and go ahead and so this is where you can, you can add on. And it is, like I said, much more complicated and than what I've, I've kind of thrown out here. And that's really honestly, again, those who really like IT or truly have some of their own little databases of their collections, please, please talk to us because that's the one thing about Simply Living. Please note, we cannot do these and create these things. These are our ideas and things that we want to help connect the silos of our communities to work together. So I think my five minutes is up. Thank you all very much. Any questions or we can talk later because really Kathy has a great presentation ready. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Okay. So if you have any questions or like I said, this is an ongoing discussion that's really been happening at the, the salons and other things. So that's the other thing we just want to kind of keep um, doing that too. So thanks, Lynn. I really appreciate it. Kathy can get her started here. Kathy is uh, just to introduce her briefly. Most of you know her. She's been here talking at the uh, Free Press uh, Salon before. And she's involved with the Ready for 100 campaign, working statewide with mayors and also in Columbus to, for Ready for 100 Columbus specifically, trying to get the mayor and the city council to commit to a serious effort yeah. to make our community sustainable. So, which is again, part of the, part of the broad mission of uh, Simply Living. All Absolutely. Right. Kathy, you ready? Yes, I think I am. Will it go slideshow from the beginning? Yeah, so um, some of you may have seen an article that I wrote for Columbus Underground um, that ran in Columbus Underground about the city's climate action plan. Um, you, um, you may know, well, I'll get into this um, here. And there's also been a little bit of coverage in the dispatch and WOSU. Um, there was a city, there was a hearing before city council last week that um, Chuck testified at and 18 people did spoken testimony and 15 did written testimony about the Columbus Climate Action Plan. I've also got an action alert that I will put in when I can because I don't think I can get to the chat when I'm screen sharing. Uh, let's see. All right. So um, just to reference why this is so important is the climate crisis. It's an absolute emergency. I have a whole other presentation going over that if anyone is interested in that sometime. Um, but it talks about the environmental costs, the human costs. And, um, you know, as I'm sure everyone here knows, climate change is caused by carbon emissions. 
Cities are responsible for 70% of carbon emissions. And we happen to live in the 14th largest city in the country and the sixth highest carbon emitting state. So what we do about our carbon emissions in Columbus matters. And um, that's why we are you know, kind of pushing the city on their draft climate action plan. So the science says that since pre-industrial times, since basically we started burning fossil fuels, we've warmed the planet one degree Celsius, which is a couple of degrees Fahrenheit, I think 1.7 maybe. Um, and that might not sound like a lot, but if you think about your body temperature, if you're running a fever of two, three degrees, four degrees, it becomes a lot. Um, and that's the same for the planet. It really affects all the systems on the planet. So scientists and said from the Paris Agreement that we should try to hold warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're basically there because the carbon we've already emitted will stay in the atmosphere for 100 years, continuing to warm. Um, so basically, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. And so what the science for a 2018 landmark study said, we must cut carbon emissions 45% by 2030 and to zero by 2050 if we want a chance of a livable planet. Um, and so Mayor Ginther issued this very nice communication at the time of the study and said, yes, we, want, we need to cut carbon emissions. This is what the science says we need to do. So in Columbus, um, around that same time, Columbus won the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant to um, really help the city grapple with its carbon emissions and sustainability plans. Columbus had never done a you know, full inventory. Well, I guess they've been doing some inventory of carbon emissions, but like really a full plan to tackle carbon emissions had not been done. They convened the Sustainable Columbus Advisory Group, which I'm on and about 30 people are on from different, like Klaus from Green Columbus is on, Laura Fay from Flo, um, Brittany, uh, Brittany from Morpsey, um, and, and, so, and some business people. Um, they've done some pretty good, um, I guess, ambitious programs. Like they set a goal of 30,000 home energy audits in two years and they made that. They passed an energy benchmarking ordinance requiring owners of very large buildings to track their energy use, um, presumably so we can see who's using a lot of energy and is an inefficient building that we can get them to bring that down. Mm -hmm. um, they're building a solar farm on an old landfill and you may have heard about um, the dam up in Dublin, O'Shaughnessy Dam, they're going to start using that to make electricity. Um, and then in November, we passed aggregation for 100% renewable energy, which is really huge. So then the draft climate plan became public the next month. So what it shows, this is basically a snapshot of our carbon emissions in Columbus over the last um, like 2013 to 2018. 2018 is considered the baseline when the plan says we're going to reduce emissions X percent by X year. They're talking about from 2018. And like many cities, most cities, buildings are the top source of our carbon emissions. Transportation is second. Um, but you can see in Columbus that buildings, which are um, yellow is commercial buildings, blue is residential, and then I think industrial is a, is a very small amount that's green at the top. Um, those have actually been declining, but the transportation emissions, which are these light green ones at the bottom, those are going up. And those are going up because we don't have a great public transportation system in Columbus, and a lot of people are moving here, and they're putting their gas cars on the interstates, and they're driving their gas cars and emitting carbon. So this tells us we really have to do something about transportation in particular, but also buildings because those are the, still the top emitters. So if you download a copy of the Climate Action Plan, um, you'll see three pages that look kind of like this one. Um, these are, there are 30 goals. This is each one of these goals in five areas. So each of the, or sorry, in five areas, which are neighborhoods, climate solutions, neighborhoods, building transportations and waste. And then there's 13 action items, but those 13 items are broken down into 30 specific goals. But the overarching goal of the climate plan is to cut emissions 25% by 2030, um, which we're glad they're cutting the emissions, but we think it needs to be in line with science. Science has said 45%. And you can see that if we're lowering it 25% by 2030, that we still have a long way to go to get to zero by 2050. We're kind of kicking half the can down the road, if you will. So how can we get to 45%? 
Okay, so so this is just back of the napkin, figuring out that that I kind of did, but you know we can definitely do more than what's in the plan. But step one is community choice aggregation, which is in the plan, and we're already doing that. This is this is actually really huge, and and the Columbus has a really a model program for what other cities should be doing because this is all electricity. Um, to be supplied with 100% renewable energy through local build-out wind and solar projects in Ohio. And it's also going to generate um, to uh, 1.5 to 2 million in community grant funds that we can use to help residents make energy upgrades for workforce development. They're talking about a possible green bank in there. I don't know what's going to happen with that. But it's going to reduce our emissions in Columbus around 12%. So there's 12% right off the bat that we are already going to be doing. So the next step would be buildings, because obviously buildings are, you know, where a lot of emissions are happening. And we think there's several areas the plan could increase its goals here. So one is there's one goal about increasing building efficiency in Columbus. And their goal is 10, basically 10% 10 by 2030. And we think that needs to be at least doubled. Um, residential energy efficiency is important for low income people because they have a high energy burden. And that's because a lot of the buildings they live in, whether they're renting or owning, are very inefficient. And so help people make energy upgrades so that it saves them money on their energy bills and that puts actual money in their pocket. Um, Commercial is already reducing its emissions. They need to keep doing that. It saves them money as well. City buildings are totally under the city control. We can, the city can do this anytime it wants. And building efficiency is a huge bang for your buck in lowering emissions. So we think if they double that goal, they could reduce emissions potentially as much as aggregation is, like another 12, 13%, something like that. So another area in buildings is net zero buildings. And this is a picture of the Cincinnati um, District 3 police station, which is a net zero building. Cincinnati is very proud of that. Um, in the uh, climate plan, it says, we're gonna pilot four city buildings that are zero carbon by 2030 and have zero carbon design standards in 2050. And so we looked at what are other cities doing? Well, DC is gonna have those zero carbon design standards by mid 2020s. Um, Portland is saying all new buildings must be net zero by 2030. New York City is saying all buildings, old or new, must be net zero by 2050. So we think Columbus could do that. We could make these design standards. Now, in Ohio, cities are not allowed to have, to require higher building standards than the state has, but they can incentivize it. And one way they can incentivize it is Developers shouldn't be getting tax breaks unless they're building net zero or minimum LEED certified. That the city needs, it's giving away a lot of tax breaks as Joe here knows very well. Um, we need to be getting something for those tax breaks if we're gonna get them. Away. And that could save some more emissions. Another area is residential solar. So the city's plan says 10 megawatts of residential solar by 2030. 500 by 2050. And I actually had to ask, is that a typo? And I was told, no, that's not a typo. And so other cities have installed a lot more. So through incentives or bulk purchase programs, Los Angeles installed almost 250 megawatts in five years. Now you have to fund that, if you're, especially if you're um, supplying incentives. But we could do, if a kilo, uh, a, an average house is a five kilowatt system, many houses are bigger, um, so that would be, if we wanted to reach 200 megawatts, that would be around 40,000 home installations. And we just did 30,000 home energy audits in two years. It seems like we should be able to do 40,000 solar installations by 2030. So the other area that's big is transportation, and this is especially important in Columbus. So there's a few things under here we looked at. Um, one that surprised me was electric vehicle ownership. Um, so the city's goal is 10% of all car registrations by 2030 should be electric. But the projections from like really mainstream places like Bloomberg and De Deloitte say that in the United States by 2030, about 28% of sales will be electric. 
So we think the city should at least be able to put what the projections are in their plan and probably more because we have Smart Columbus whose one of its entire purposes is to get people into electric vehicles. Um, and so that also means building up more charging stations. But if you get people out of gas cars and then, you know, and also by then we were getting more of a used market in EVs. There, there is some used market now. My first EV was used, but there needs to be a lot more of that. And once electric vehicles kind of become a thing, that's really going to cut down our carbon emissions in Columbus. The other area is um, city vehicles, especially buses. So the plan, the draft plan's goal is to pilot 30 city heavy duty vehicles, but um, half the buses in the world are going to be electric by mid 2020s and electric buses save cities money, um, not only because of the fuel, the less in the fuel cost, you have a little bit of electricity, but it's not comparable to gas, but also there are almost no maintenance and that's true of an electric vehicle as well. There's just almost no maintenance. Um, so we think the city should be moving half of its bus fleet to be electric by 2030. And that, and that this would again, save a lot of carbon emissions. And then a related area is vehicle miles traveled um, per capita. So the city, want, its plan is to reduce that by 15%. And you do that by building out public transportation, by having safe sidewalks, bike lanes, um, having telecommuting options for people. And even just raising that, their goal just a little bit would again save more carbon emissions. So a climate plan is not just um, carbon emissions, it's also about equity. And we know that the people who've done the least to cause the climate crisis are often the most affected and the least resilient. That's true worldwide and that's also true locally in Columbus. And that's why the plan has this sustainable neighborhoods section. Um, so they have several goals about, about mapping out resiliency hubs, um, which is like say a building that people can go to if there's a huge cold snap, they can go to warm up or if there's a heat wave, they can go to cool down or if, you know the electricity goes out somewhere, there's a place where the power will stay on. Um, another goal is to identify gaps in, uh, gaps to access to green space or to or an assessment of physical vulnerability, like where is it going to flood, for example. Um, and all these, we need to do all those things, but the climate plan says we're going to do these assessments. We're going to take until 2030 to do the assessments and not fix anything until 2050. And we think that the assessments can be done in a couple of years and then fix everything by 2030. And that's really important for equity. Um, I'll kind of skip this one. There's several other low goals in there and I can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. There's several things that are missing as well. There's no mention of green roofs. There's no mention of community gardens, which um, is, uh, yeah, of community gardens. Um, Cleveland has a special zoning designation for urban farms. And we're having, you know, we are losing some community gardens that are really points of pride in their neighborhood and they're getting bought out and plowed under for development. And that's wrong. That's not the way we should be going. Um, community solar is also missing and that's something hard to do in AEP territory because of Ohio law, but our municipal Columbus Division of Power could do it. And we're asking the city to think about using their Division of Power in a creative way. Also lead pipe replacement. We have 30,000 homes in Columbus still served by lead pipes and those need to be replaced. <coughs> Well, Columbus also is working on a big transportation plan called Link Us, a corridor plan that would funnel development into corridors. They're actively working on the Northwest and the East-West corridor now. So we know they can think big, but we're just asking them to think big throughout this plan, not just in a couple of places. So that's basically our recommendations. We want the climate plan to the ambition increased, we want to do that through looking at buildings, transportation, and incentivizing clean development. And that's that's what I've got. I can try to answer any questions. So we can open up the questions. We've already got a couple of comments in the uh, in the chat, uh, and I would just emphasize that uh, Kathy, you want to mention that there's a way for everybody. Uh, to get get feedback and talk to the city council. That's that's your action uh, uh, option for people. So.
So it, do we have a slide on that? We're going to try to. Oh, I don't have a slide, but Maida just dropped the link in the chat. And, oh, okay, great. Uh, it's an oh, action yeah, alert that went yeah. out through uh, through Sierra Club, um, and um, we'd love you to take action. Just click that link and and take action with that, and that'll send a direct a letter directly to every member of City Council and several people on the Sustainable Columbus office. And if you look in the chat, you'll see some comments about uh, bringing the trolleys back. We have a start. So take a look at that. Uh, Tom Over has uh, commented that uh, there's you, you're not serious unless you account take into account veganism. Um, Thank you. We have, have Arai here. That's not included in the plan. Yeah, uh, there's nothing about food. And that right. could go with food. urban gardens too. And, and that, yeah, veganic agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, for example, um, that brings us to tie in with a local bank. A public bank. A public bank could provide low interest loans to people who are start businesses, starting vegan restaurants, starting uh, uh, almost all the local uh, organic farmers doing urban farming are not making enough money to satisfy. Right now, we're subsidizing the big, big farms and not mm -hmm. uh, investing in our small local urban agriculture. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So I think now, can we take the slide off so I can see who's got their hands, so everybody can see who, whose hands are up. Okay, we got to, uh, okay. So I think, Steve, did you have a, you had your hand up. You want to unmute and ask a question? Bob was in front of me. Bob, you want to go first? And then I think Joe's after me. I don't know, Joe, was that right? Yeah. <laughs> <Not> you. <laughs> okay. I've been on a solitary crusade since the arrival of COVID-19 because I'm a non-driver and I really resent having to find somebody to drive me to a testing site and then their car is idling for 20 minutes as they go around a circle and all these additional hours of use of cars and um, parades that become car events and other forms of transportation are, are, are being overlooked more and more. Is there any a group or people that are on the same crusade that I feel like I'm a solitary crusader on. Oh, well, like an anti-car crusade or? Well, I mean, you know, to get a test for COVID, I have to find somebody to drive me over near Riverside yeah, Hospital yeah. and their car is not only driving me there, but then it's idling for 20 minutes as we move around a circle and there's a lot more carbon emissions because of that. Yeah. I can't walk up there myself. And there's other things besides COVID tests. Right, yeah. I, I mean, this is the kind of thing we need a good public transportation system for. And I think Riverside Hospital is probably on that Northwest Corridor. So there is planning around at least that particular corridor. Um, well, but, I could take the bus to North Broadway and Olentangy River Road, but I would not be allowed to stand with the cars as they're going around that circle. Like, can, is Riverside Hospital accessible by bus? Well, the building just north of Coles on Olentangy River Road, I don't mean to get into specifics about one particular site, but there's just multiple places where the only way you're allowed to do it is by driving a car there. Yeah. If you're this a is, driver for whatever reason, you're, you're marginalized. Yeah, this is a very car-centric city and you know, it's, the city should have been acting on that decades ago. You know, with talking to Transit Columbus, which is advocating for uh, local, you know, for rail, and for all these options that we're that you're talking about, Bob. It's very important. So I'm acting another great just COVID nineteen thing and, and the change in the culture, the reversal in the culture. Yeah. yeah, this isn't anything that's going to happen in time for COVID-19 testing, I hate to say. Yeah. I mean, they are trying with things like this Link Us initiative, but they've got, you know, we've got a long way to go. Okay, um, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, uh, Raya, were you on the, did you have your hand up too? Did you want to talk? I did, okay. yes, I did, of course. Um, <laughs> Go ahead and I'll, I'll, so, I'll sit I, back. Sorry, Joe, I didn't mean, but she had her hand up, I guess, before. Oh. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, gents. Um, so we have an initiative with Vegan Shift that's called Vegan Options Daily. 
And we would like to see that kind of resolution declared by the city, but absolutely part of the sustainability program. And um, it's, a, it's basically a pledge to support vegan options to be available, affordable, accessible everywhere, every day for everyone. Um, so that those who would choose to be vegan can, no matter what day of week it is. There's a lot of programs out there that seem, people seem to promote that are like Fur Free Fridays or, you know, uh, Meatless Mondays or, or campaigns like that, where you get like one day a week that doesn't even specify vegan empowerment. And so our program, Vegan Options Daily, is to ensure that vegans have, the, and those who would be vegan or those who have to eat vegan for um, clinical reasons they shouldn't have to disclose that they have cardiovascular disease they're trying to prevent or cure or reverse or whatever so there's a lot of reasons to provide vegan equivalent alternatives to the convention and especially for anything discussing a sustainability matter it should be very clear that um, plant pure living is the most um, sustainable behavior of hu humanity can embrace and adapt to so we should definitely be providing language in any kind of um, programs to to empower that. Right on, Orion. You, you know what action to take now, right? The, follow that link in the chat and uh, make your point to the to the city so they'll get that feedback. Okay. Uh, a, I'm, uh, I'm also adding my directory right now to your soul right now. Right on. I'm so, so glad to hear that, you know, because many of you know Raya writes for a free press and uh, has a column specifically on uh, vegan dining and uh, she's aware of these organizations that uh, uh, where you can get vegan options uh, at local restaurants and we want people to, to support those. So awesome. And that'll be a separate category. We'll have a great way, an easy way for people to find all the options by zip code any way you find neighborhood. So cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. I, I really think the cost of garden fig is a tragedy, it, absolute. I mean, all they're doing is trying to pile people up on top of one another to maximize the amount of money they can make as quick as they can make it. Another thing I wanted to bring up was that uh, they had 161, they built that out to Newark and they had that center strip on it. I don't know if Morpsey was planning to put uh, mass transit in the middle of that, or they just said maybe later, whatever, maybe Joe, you can talk to that or had an idea. But uh, I, I think concentrating all these people into the city and piling them on top of one another, not a good idea. The whole apartment movement down there, awful. Then you got this guy burning his freaking torches out in front of the apartment. Like, what the hell, you know? Dude, it's not like we're not having any global warming problems, are we? Anyway, I'll get off. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. You want to comment, Joe? Yeah, I just uh, some comments. And I think maybe one of the things the general public looks at Columbus like, you know, there's no manufacturing here. So the, the carbon emissions isn't probably as great. But we all know in the summer, all the air alerts that we have pollution alerts that we get that that's absolutely not true. And also, I don't think they I think we got to educate them more in terms of the carbon emissions from the, the buildings. And the one thing about the transportation, and Kathy, I really, uh, I was on the uh, climate action uh, call and I really appreciate every, all your comments and yet uh, glad the dispatch followed up on some of your quotes too, but <laughs> CODA, it wasn't too terribly long, uh, long ago that they just built that brand new natural gas facility out there for their buses. I was actually, no. I, I was uh, working at the time doing construction safety audits on the project. So I'm very familiar with it. And I thought, you know, they were doing all that, spending tons of money on that. And now, as you said, you know, this is just putting more into the air. This is, you know, and, and it's like trying to get them to change to electric now. That's going to be a challenge. I think we all know that. And, and uh, I mean, it just makes so much sense to go to electric. But, man, they just spend a ton of money on that natural gas facility out there. And uh, uh, it's a shame. That is a shame. Uh, people think that gas is cleaner and it's just not. It's from fracking. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the uh, well, okay, that, yeah, that's true. Uh, we're running a little short on time, but I want to make sure that Bill Lyons, who's in the house on the screen, 
uh, has an announcement to make and uh, we'll give, give him an option to do that. Now we can stay later. We can say we keep asking questions and discussing these various issues. They're, they're great, we appreciate it. But uh, Bill requested time and go with it, Bill. Okay, thanks, Chuck. And uh, first of all, if you're not aware, I wanna make you aware that uh, there's a democracy film series that the Ohio Community Rights Network, which I'm the president now, but of course, uh, Columbus Community Bill of Rights is part of the Ohio Community Rights Network and Simply Living, which we're grateful for their support and Chuck's support. Uh, we're sponsoring a four part uh, film series with question and answers with prominent people associated with the films. Uh, our first film will be coming up here in two weeks from tomorrow. And it's called, What is Democracy? Now, what is more important than democracy? Uh, especially, we just had an election, and then when we can think about why is it that people, the majority of people support things like sensible gun laws, health care for all, racial justice, right to safe water, air, and soil, campaign finance laws, voting rights laws, and we're not getting it. So we're going to have, not only is it a great film, but the filmmaker, who's also a writer, who's written a book, and this is her book here, uh, Democracy May Not Exist, but I've been reading it, but we'll miss it when it's gone. And she's written other books, and she's also the filmmaker and, and an activist, uh, Astra Taylor. So we're very excited to have her on. I've seen her have conversations with Angela Davis on Zoom. So she's very enlightening. And uh, so that's our first film. So I, uh, uh, then, uh, so all we're asking, uh, I'll put the link in the chat for that uh, series so you can go and you can sign up for that. I just put it in right now. And uh, all we're asking is a minimum, if you can, if you can afford, of a $5 donation to cover the cost for the films because we have to pay for them. Uh, the second one we're going to have is just after Earth Day, which is very uh, appropriate for Invisible Hand, which has to do with rights of nature, which is another way forward uh, into all of our crises with democracy and the environment. Um, and we're going to have Marky e. Miller from Toledoans for Safe Water, who was uh, who's spoken at the United Nations and who's a, a real advocate uh, for rights of nature and uh, was instrumental with her group in passing the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, uh, which is really a big deal, I think, in the US. The third film we're going to have, uh, and uh, it's going to be um, the new corporation. There was a the corporation back in 2003, but this is the new corporation. It's a great film, very powerful. It's not out in the theaters yet. We're going to have that. That's going to be on August 29th. They're all going to be Sundays at 2 p.m. And you're going to be given a link if you register uh, 24 hours before the film, where you'll have 24 hours to uh, before the question and answer to watch the films. And then the question and answer. And so the third one is going to be with Greg Coleridge, who with Move to Amend, their outreach director, is very, very knowledgeable about corporations because they're trying to get uh, amendment passes to say corporations are not people and money is not speech. And then the fourth one will be We the People 2.0 and talking about the community rights movement, rights of nature movement, and talking about our constitution and many other things. And we're going to have Cell Def Organizer and Ohio Community uh, Rights Network uh, uh, member Tish O'Dell. And that's going to be October 21st, uh, 24th at 2 p.m., the week before, one week before Halloween. So please uh, check that out. Go. We're asking for, if you can, uh, a minimum $5 donation for the uh, films and then the question and answer. And we're going to have great people on. So by democracy, uh, we really need to get that discussion going. And we welcome all of you to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That's uh, awesome. And Simply Living is partnering with uh, the Ohio Community Rights Network. And uh, uh, so we'll help promoting that just as we're partnering tonight with Free Press. Uh, we're happy to uh, partner with other organizations. We need to do a lot more of that so we can get a consistent, progressive voice that over that 
all of us, you know, yes, we can. We have all these great groups, progressive groups in Columbus. We need to have a, the ability to get the word out to everybody and then start making democracy happen right here. So we don't have these uh, uh, mon monopoly capitalism influencing the public bank, all the kinds of things we want to get done, make it happen. We've got to like have the democracy to elect the people to make it happen. Steve's been tracking the, uh, uh, the stack. So who's next? Steve. Chris Harden, Chris Harden, you there? I'm asking him to unmute. Chris Harden? Yep, I'm here. You're up. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Oh, great. Well, tonight's groundbreaking for me because this is my first ever Zoom call. So, woohoo! <laughs> um, anyways, um, some of you might know that um, I'm a former Simply Living board member and also a former office manager. And um, uh, the, my next comments are directed primarily to Kathy. About uh, three to four months into this COVID situation, I got to thinking, how much has COVID affected, now I'm going to use air quotes, in a positive way to decreasing the amount of carbon emissions based on the fact that people are not um, driving their vehicles as uh, uh, single occupants, um, uh, office buildings, people are telecommuting, uh, public um, buildings, same thing. Um, people are, are not dining out at, at the, uh, as often as uh, we have been accustomed to. So I wonder if there's an organization, whether it's globally or nationally, that's actually tracking what's happened over the course of these 14 months when life has changed, you know, We've had fewer planes in the air, fewer cruise ships in the water. So I'm just going to leave it there for Kathy to respond. Yeah, actually, there has been some research on that. I remember seeing it. So I Googled while you were speaking. And um, basically, the bottom line is, yes, COVID has reduced some emissions, but not by a lot. And if we go back to normal, they're just going to come back up again. And so... Really, we need to see this as an opportunity to transition into the world we need. Um, I mean, I know it's very nice when we can all get together in person, but personally, I like telecommuting. I like just having to go to my desk and not having to fight traffic to go to work. And I have, I'm working with people in Wisconsin right now that I've never met except through Zoom. And I hope I can go there and see them sometime, but we're doing a lot of great, like you can work with people anywhere on Zoom or, you know, not just Zoom, but, you know, in telecommute. So I'm hoping that, you know, some, some of what we've learned during this will stay with us, that people will have flexible telecommuting options because before they were told, well, you could never do that job from home. Well, watch us, you know, we're all doing it from home. So, oh, I, I said I would put that article, this is a study from Nature. Um, and so that's what um, I guess the research shows is that it, it did cut carbon emissions some, but not as much as we would have thought and it's kind of bouncing back. And I see that uh, Morpsey has an air quality report. There's a link in the chat. Uh, one of the things I've learned from the uh, the uh, Columbus, the community rights people in general, is that the you know the clean air, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency is now they often call it the Environmental Permitting Agency. In other words, it's a question of how much pollution can they get away with? You know, like uh, no, we want clean air, clean water, and soil that uh, isn't poisoned to make the food we grow. Just just ranting. Other other question: Who's next in the stack? Anybody? I just turned down my phone. Yes, I'm on two devices because I can't hear on my laptop. So I can hear on my phone. And, but uh, my question is in regards to public transit. And so... There is a huge problem, as mentioned earlier, someone mentioned earlier about, about the, 
disadvantages of, like, for example, CODA, because it's not convenient for some people in some communities for, because you, you spend, like, pretty much your whole day going from point A to point B. I mean, for example, if you don't have, like, if you don't have, like, all the amenities all together, it's going to be hard. And if you have to go, like, across town, let's say you live in Reynoldsburg and you have an appointment in Clintonville, that's, like, an hour and a half, two-hour trip on the bus. And the west side is a whole mess. I know people who live out near what, Galloway, Hilltop, go downtown and they transfer just to go to Grove City. In Grove City, if you want, want to go to Hilliard, you have to go downtown to transfer to go back out west to go out to Hilliard, or you could go up north to Clintonville and then catch that bus to Hilliard. It, it's a whole it's a whole mess. It could be better. And it's it was worse about this time about seven, ten months ago, but um, but this disparity about public transit needs to be addressed. And it's for sure, but COVID routes have been different than they were like five years ago. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about bus rapid transit or whatever you want to say, Kathy? Um, sure. Well, I'm going to put a link in the chat to the Link Us plan, which is the corridor project that I referenced at the end. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to be like kind of how the city managers are envisioning the future of Columbus in with development, transportation, jobs. So concentrating everything in these corridors so that it would make public transportation and getting people from point A to point B a lot I guess easier because you're you're working your job and your where you live and where you like might go shop or out to eat like they're kind of kind of everything is along these corridors and then within those corridors they're looking at bus rapid transit to get people from point A to point B so what well, be a bus rapid transit or BRT it's sort of like trying to make riding the bus as rail-like as possible. Um, so like you buy your tickets beforehand and you have same level boarding, you have covered stations where and that's like where you buy your tickets. So you're not fumbling with your money getting on. Um, they get preference for the lights. Um, so they move quickly between stations. Um, and so it's like kind of making the bus, riding the bus more like riding the train. And there are other cities that are using this to great effect. Cleveland has a bus rapid transit system um, with their health line going between, I guess, some, some of their hospitals and the Cleveland Clinic. So if we can truly do that in Columbus, um, the meetings that have been had on Link Us so far, um, there have been a lot of people there pushing for light rail, which, and I was one of those. <laughs> um, and it may be that they will kind of start with designated lanes for bus rapid transit but once they do that like then it would then they could easily like you know, easily but at some point they could switch that to light rail but i i think that's kind of how they're trying to solve this issue of you know so many people moving to columbus and not a great public transportation system as we you know and, and currently and and trying to make that better so i would say get involved with the link us and let them know your feedback on that. And, and yes, I agree Columbus needs light rail. We're the only, the largest city in the country with no form of rail. And then we need high-speed rail between the cities of, you know, the three C's and, you know, Pittsburgh and Chicago and Dayton, you know, like other countries have. <laughs> is, um, and, and the light rail, or not the light rail, the um, high-speed rail between cities would help bring down the amount of air travel because it's really good for like the short to medium long haul trips. You might still fly like cross country if you were flying to San Francisco or something, but like to go to Chicago, you know, you could take a train and it would be a lot faster and easier. Yes, and I have a daughter in Chicago, so I want that. Um, just a comment back to the public banks, they can do uh, low interest loans for infrastructure projects like light rail. 
And at the federal level, a lot of you know Falal Kaboob, who's a professor of economics at Denison, who is very tuned into the modern money theory, MMT economics, which a great example is the $1.9 trillion that we just got passed. Uh, so you see they can do that without inflation. Uh, it's possible for the uh, federal government, not with our taxpayer money, with our money, the money that uh, we create at the national level called the dollar, and we can just write a check tell the Federal Reserve to put the checks in your mail. Look this weekend, you're gonna get, hope most of us are gonna get 1400 bucks. Okay, that can be done. That can be done to invest in our communities. Some of the MMT people call the difference between uh, the first, the bailout which bailed out Wall Street in 2008 and nine. Uh, great, they spent trillions of dollars bailing out the, covering basically the toxic assets of the banks, right? Now they're talking about Community, they call that uh, QE, quantitative easing. You probably heard that term. Now we're looking at community QE. How about this kind of investment in people and communities to get the kind of agenda that everybody knows we want and need, the great majority of people? Okay, uh, who, who's next? Anybody uh, in the queue? Sandy Bolsinius, who's had her hand up a while back in chat. Sandy, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, quick announcement. In fact, I'm going to send it right now. Okay. Um, at least I'm trying to. <laughs> um, but at any rate, their Move to Men Central Ohio is having um, a, a program on the 25th of March. And the title is Your Rights and Risk Under New Ohio Protest Laws. Many of you are probably familiar with the fact that the state keeps trying to make it harder for us and even illegal for us to um, express our opinions out in the public or really anywhere. Um, there's a real danger to this. These laws are, um, are being unrolled in other places, other states as well. So um, I really recommend that you tune into this. The speakers will be Reverend Joan and Tad Pinkston, a lawyer, and both of them are with the um, Unitarian Church um, Justice Program. And um, seven o'clock, I, I put the link there, check it out. And if you um, want to make sure you get these, because we do these monthly, if you want to make sure you're getting these um, announcements, when you get to that move to men link, make sure you've signed up, you, you've signed the petition that says corporations are not people and money is not speech. And you will get these um, directly to your email all the, um, every month. Let me know if you have any questions. Any questions for Sandy? Move to Amend's really been doing great stuff lately. They've been very active uh, at every level and uh, getting pushing legislation, getting more people to co-sign uh, at the national level. Talk to your Congress people. We're not going to have the democracy without Move to Amend. That's the bottom line. Gotta get, I, I, yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah. I've already copied the link and it links to UUJC rather than move to amend. Is that accurate? Uh, I got to unmute Sandy. Sandy, you're Thank mute. you, Bob. I, that shouldn't be the case, but I will change it in the chat. Thank you. And UUJO is doing good stuff. The Democratic Socialists are doing good stuff. But there's a lot of growth in the progressive movement generally now, and that's for good reason. We've got to keep, keep the uh, people in power, and we've got to take this moment of getting rid of Reaganism for 40 years and start pushing toward the agenda for government being able to do stuff for us. Uh, anybody else? Just raise your hand. I think most people are uh, got their video up there. Lynn Stan is up. Unmute, Lynn. Thank you. Well, back to the city. Um, I think that if people aren't familiar with it, that one of um, Columbus's sister cities is, is it called Curitiba? Chuck, is that correct how it's pronounced? Curitiba, Brazil. Yeah. Brazil. And it's considered the greenest city in the world. And I suggest you watch it because it just kind of reminds us what type of... Um, 
future is, is possible and that it is happening all over the world. And I think that's the biggest thing is that we all know our city needs to hear us. All of our decision makers need to keep hearing us that this stuff is not new. They're not, it's not rocket science, okay? It's being done, all of this stuff. In fact, even so, so, so much more, even um, ways to have community ownership and um, just so much different things. And I see it could be, of course, a lot of free press stuff, but I wanted to, to point that out to you because um, it, I think it's kind of a nice little um, overview of what the city seems to be trying to achieve, um, but they don't know it. They don't really, they don't know the specifics. <laughs> so this is an example of where they're doing it. And um, I think that that kind of really helps. The other thing is that um, Smart Columbus, and it totally amazes me ever really for the, like the last two years plus, how Smart Columbus is so um, unconnected to the, the, the grass roots. It is so much about the grass tops. And I think that they're, um, they, I, I now figure, I now understand it more, but they are doing some really interesting things. And I hope that they will come to this arena and talk about type of the things because they have, they talk about, so if other people are interested in how Smart Columbus could be a little bit more tied to some of the, what they're talking about doing in the future and the little things and project things that they're doing now, how it can perhaps help to make things a little bit easier now for our transportation. So I think that was just, it was, it just amazes me that they never are really part of any of these discussions. Thank you, Lynn. And I see that uh, Michael Duty's in the house. Michael, did you want to unmute and give us a little update on what's happening with the uh, community garden, the South Side, Kosu Street? You're, you're still muted, but you gotta, you're close. It's the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, there, you there you go. Okay. Um, well, I met with Priscilla Tyson this week and uh, she said that, first of all, she said she didn't speak to developers, then her aide, she thought, spoke to the developers and then she said, uh, that she spoke to the developers, um, a real head scratcher, but they're not going to relent any part of the land. But then I just heard this afternoon that they're going to build nine houses instead of 10. Well, the whole argument was they couldn't have the garden because we need absolutely 10 houses uh, to make our, uh, our loans. It's been very frustrating uh, finding that um, we're not getting the best and brightest. I had to repeat a very basic thing three times to Priscilla Tyson and then um, she also said that we needed to stop the personal attacks on the developers. And then she got into a discussion. Well, if you guys leave, um, you know, you've got $5,000 the developers said that he'd give you. I have brokered that. They all wanted to be the big shots. And I said, well, you know, if we do leave, um, she goes, where would you go? What garden have you picked? What lot of land? I said, we'd, we'd be our organ donors. Uh, you know, I'm tired. There's plenty of other gardens I can help. And she goes, you can't use that term organ donors. That's ugly. I said, well, we're a living organism. And so uh, I think organ donors are about right. And so um, in regards to the personal attacks, uh, I said, what personal attacks? I said, we're just bringing up things that we, that we desire. I don't think they like that free press article at all. This week news uh, had uh, a more glowing um, thing for the developers. I also brought up how the process, how zoning is uh, in this town. And uh, um, I just was really taken aback when she began. In of 28 minutes, she spent nearly 10 minutes talking about, um, well, they've given you $5,000. And I, I said, well, we just give to different gardens around. And um, she goes, oh, then, then maybe... I think they'd probably only do $1,000 in that scenario because you need to go, the whole thing is you're going to move the garden but to another place. And I said, well, why don't you just leave that to, between them and me if that's the case? Why are you getting involved? And she says, well, because I've talked to them and $1,000 sounds fair to me for them, from them to give you. I said, you're doing their bidding. She was very offended at that, but I called truth to power 
and she was doing their bidding. Um, you know, the whole thing is we're very much for affordable housing, but not on this situation. And it is what it is. Um, at some point, you guys are one of the first to find out. Uh, I'm still going to speak in front of council and have two other speakers um, because uh, even though we're going down, we're going down with uh, knowledge and honesty on our side. So that's about it. If anybody has any questions, um, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting. And when the guy named Curtis Davis is the zoning chair for the Southside Area Commission and owes tens of thousands of dollars in back taxes to the um, city of Columbus uh, and the state of Ohio, I don't get it. <laughs> well, Michael, you've done an outstanding job and we should not go down we don't even want to we, we need to we need to use this as a prototype example of how the city operates with developer input and support oh they claim it's already uh, it's a zoning issue that we have no control over they can develop we're going to do whatever they want in their property yeah uh that's the that's the model and so we yeah. need to disrupt that 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 uh, assumption pardon my dog uh, that's my dog i gotta go get your dog because i have a dog that barks all the okay. time so. well thank you everybody i'll be back in a minute all right. <laughs> you know so, what's really hypocritical is the fact that like kathy mentioned earlier they're talking about the need for community gardens for climate action and then at the new 25 million dollar linden community center uh what local matters is going to be involved with the community garden there they're going to build one and make and have food for the people in in that area. So, what hypocrites, you know? So the city <laughs> won't go to bat for Michael, but they'll go to. But you know, they'll talk about the need. And I mean, it's it just makes me sick. I, I just had and and I had some announcements. Just an, a quick yeah, announcement. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. The um, I think most of you are aware of the fact that uh, uh, they're building a new county jail, like three hundred plus million dollars out there on Fisher Road. You know, the, the jail downtown is, is well, in better terms, it, it's a shithole. I think everybody knows that. Probably heard about, maybe you've heard about experiences. But regardless of that, um, I just wanted you to be aware that uh, uh, here in the very near future, uh, they're, they're actually in the, I'm sorry, jumping ahead a little bit. The new jail is going to incorporate a dedicated section for women, and it's also going to have a detox facility in it. And, I mean, they're trying to really make this jail, build it the right way and to help prisoners when they get out to help them, you know, uh, get a job and things of that nature. Uh, myself and uh, Amy Wicks, his mother, and several other people, probably you remember Amy Wicks's name. She was just out there every day, every minute of the day, advocating for prisoners' rights uh, and addicts that were in jail, trying to get them help and such. Uh, we're trying to get either that women's uh, pod or the detox facility named after her and so we're working on a campaign for that. We're going to be petitioning uh, the county commissioners and the county administrators. Uh, we're going to be sending out letters. We've already kind of started it so far. But Amy passed away a couple years ago. I think Bob might still be on the call, but he interviewed her on his show. Uh, I think it was only a couple of months prior to her, her dying. And uh, I mean, if, you, if, many of, if any of you remember her, she was all over social media. She was, you know, in everybody's ear, Ron O'Brien's, and I mean, just every politician in the city about trying to do the right thing. And many of the things she advocated for are being used at that jail. Bivitrol for prisoners when they were released that were addicts uh, to get, get them a head start, to get them clean, uh, to get a job and things like that. Now they have a Vivitrol program. And a lot of the things that are being done at that jail are because of what she did. And there's no doubt about it, and all the politicians know, but they're all taking credit for what she did, of course, because, you know, she's not a politician. She's one of us. And so her mother and I uh, and some other folks are uh, going to have a campaign. You'll see a petition on social media pretty soon, and I just hope we could get your support with it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, are there other announcements that's coming up on 8.30 here? Uh, anybody else want to uh, do a Bill rant? Lyons. Bill Lyons has got his hand up. I wanted to make a quick comment. I really think the city goes out of their way to give people these zoning exclusions. 
Um, we had a building next to us. We live downtown that uh, once you make a 50 percent rehab, then they have to go up to the current zoning, which they didn't have any parking, you know, and here they want to just cram all these people in one little spot. They're going to make gobs of money off it. And the city just says, oh, yeah, do whatever you want. And meanwhile, the people suffer. They're not representing the people. They're re representing the corporations, obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bill? Yeah, I just wanted to say with Michael's uh, issue, I've written to city council several times. And I've told them, and they've written back to me to say that, well, the developer can still uh, do development uh, even without our uh, rezoning and variance permit. So then I wrote back to them and said, well, then you shouldn't sanction what they're doing by granting them for that permit. And so that way you're sending a message that you feel that they should have to work with the people of the community to preserve this garden who's, that's been there for more than 10 years. That's a living entity. You don't just uproot gardens and put it somewhere when there's been composting, there's in memorials there, there's all kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, events that have taken place. And it's not going to be the same. And I, and then I wrote to them to tell them that it's like if somebody gave you a precious gift and somebody broke it, if somebody offered to buy you another one, is that going to make it right? No. So anyhow, I encourage everybody to write to say, okay, fine. If the developer can do what, what they're going to do in spite of your ordinance, they must ha have a reason to do it. So you shouldn't sanction what they're doing and put some pressure on them to work with the community to uh, preserve this garden and just say no to their variance and their rezoning uh, requests. So that's my comment. <clears throat> Lynn, go ahead. Um, I have to add to that and also please do not forget who are the owners of this lot that is never spoken about. And as Michael Duty knows, I keep bringing them up because the fact that nonprofits own a lot of this land and are utilizing their, um, take, in my opinion, taking advantage of those entities like Casa Garden that is out there on the ground really dealing with you know, the neighborhood and they own this land and they've been, you know, so in the end, I feel that I do not want that type of that part of the story because it affects lots of parts of other garden stories that who owns the land and why wasn't some kind of discussion at least happening in the front end and perhaps um, a small percentage to just be incorporated. It just, yes, please don't forget that part. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, uh, it's 8.30. I appreciate everybody's uh, being here. Is there, uh, it's, been, it's been really fun. It's been an honor for Simply Living to uh, host uh, for uh, Free Press tonight. Uh, we love the Free Press. We want it to be supported. Support us, the, support the Free Press and Simply Living, uh, if you can, and, uh, and the Community Bill of Rights, all the good things. If you Get your fourteen hundred dollars check. Take a hundred dollars out and put it to some nonprofit grassroots work, including uh, WGR and WCRS. Uh, so, all kinds of good people here. We're we're moving in the right direction. We have a great opportunity at this. Uh, it's an inflection point, right? We got to move us off the ground to really make big changes in the next ten years, and pushing to make that happen is uh, all of us and a lot of other people, partners, let's just keep doing it. And uh, if anybody wants to say anything, last words, you can. All right, well, first of all, th thanks Chuck for uh, filling in for Bob and Suzanne. Um, greatly appreciated. And then yeah, DJBC FBR Monday nights at 8 p.m. Next month we turn 10, uh, probably Ooh. at next month's salon, which will be before then. Um, awesome. Yeah, and this is a great discussion. And, um, but yes, um, you also have to hold the area commissions accountable as well as city council because the area commissions are the pipeline from the neighborhoods to city council. For those of you who do not live in the city of Columbus, who don't know what area commissions are, there are 21 in the city of Columbus. And that's a great yeah. point, Brian. Uh, I, I served for several years on the Northland uh, Development Commission, which is the, what functions in Northland, 28 community groups as part of it. And so I know exactly how it works. You know, I mean, there's, you know, we, we, we get together and 
the developers come in with uh, a, a request to make a change, even if we, if they don't agree to what we recommend, uh, then they just go to city council where they got seven people, they've already bought off several of them, so they, uh, they can still get it, get their way. So we need to change the structures. We need to change, uh, uh, but we need, but as li the politicians like to say, make me do it. Okay, so that's our job. We got to make them, we got to hold them accountable. We got to keep building this, uh, the great majority of people that are on our side. You can see I'm old. I got white hair. This is the first time in my life that the majority of Americans support the progressive agenda. So we just got to get together and leverage this and make it happen. Thanks, everybody. Hey,